welcome to this second in a series of three webinars about the British Council's EMI in higher education in Uzbekistan project. Um, I will give a more detailed welcome and introduction rather uh, moment, but first of all, I want to just hand over to Olga from the British Council because she wants to say a few words. Hello, good afternoon to our participants from Uzbekistan and good morning to our UK partners and colleagues. Um, I'm very pleased to start the second webinar within the NHS Medium of Instruction and Higher Education project uh, that we run in partnership with the Ministry of Higher and Secondary Special Education and Knowledge Institute for Language Education. In our first webinar, uh, we told you about the aims and outcomes of the project, among which the baseline service, uh, project resource center, uh, EMI teaching standard framework, syllabus planning tool um, that have been developed within the last year, and of course, professional development program for project teams from 16 higher education institutions uh, all over Uzbekistan. And today we would like to inform you more about monitoring evaluation that uh, have been constantly running within the project. And we will also tell how it helped us plan many program and run it in a way it uh, also responded to the needs of the project team. We also saw that uh, it's very important to uh, provide support to teachers to run uh, their EMI classes. So within the project, we have developed some tools to help teachers. And uh, um, about some of these tools, you will learn more during the webinar. So without getting into further detail, I'd like to give the floor to Jason Pitt and uh, um, uh, our Nile project coordinator from the e uh, for the EMI project, and Erkan Akin, a project consultant, who is currently working at the Faculty of Education of Eastern Mediterranean uh, University in North Cyprus. So Jason and Erkan, over to you. Thank you, Olga. Erkan, can Thank we you. go to the next slide, please? Yes, sure. Yep. So just to very introduce ourselves um, and the organization. So Nile is the organization that's been working on the, uh, on the project. Um, we are a teacher training and consultancy organization. You can see on the screen there that we um, send consultants and trainers all over the world. So to places, um, various countries and places in the world. Um, so the next screen, Erkan, please. Just to introduce ourselves, so I'm Jason Skeet. I work uh, for Nile, and my main job for Nile is that I'm the program leader for the MA that we have. Um, but I also deliver training on EMI and also CLIL and formative assessment and materials. I'll let Erkan introduce himself. Sure, thanks, Jason. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining in and we're delighted to be sharing our experience of the project with you today in this webinar. Um, I have a degree in applied linguistics. Uh, I did my PhD on EMI, looking specifically at the planning uh, implementation and the process of EMI uh, in higher education. Uh, I'm a language specialist, an English an ESP, an EAP teacher myself, uh, and interested in supporting the process of EMI and how to better collaborate with EMI teachers to maximize EMI learning experiences. And thanks to involvement in this project, I, we have a much better understanding of the importance of this close communication with uh, and collaboration between EMI teachers and ESP teachers uh, for the benefit of the both parties, um, the details of which we will be talking about in this webinar today. Yeah, Jason. Thanks, Erkan. Okay. Um, can we go to the next screen? Okay, um, we seem to have some scribbles on our screen, Erkan. I'm not sure <laughs> where it comes from, but we can leave them for the time being. Uh, so this is just an overview of um, what we're going to be talking about. I'm going to give a, a, a brief overview of the project. For those of you who came to the first webinar, this is going to be repeating some information, but I thought we should just uh, recap, remind um, everyone about 
the main aims of the project. And some of you uh, may not have come to that first webinar, so that could be important information. Um, by the way, at the end of the webinar, I will tell you how to access a recording of the first webinar. Then the second main section of the webinar is about the monitoring and evaluation that we've done. Um, that Erkan is going to be talking you through that section. And then the third part of the webinar, I'm going to talk about some of the tools that we've developed to support teachers. And we are using the term EMI teacher, by the way. In the first webinar, uh, we talked about why we use this term EMI teacher. So you'll have to watch that recording to find out the reason for that. OK, so that's an overview of what we're going to talk about. Let me then explain and give a very brief overview of the project. So Erkan, can we go to the next slide? Sure. We have here the main aims of the project. So these are the aims set by the British Council. You can see the three aims there to build and develop capacity for delivering EMI um, in higher education institutes in Uzbekistan, um, to contribute to longer term and hopefully including national EMI policies and strategy development, and to also to encourage internal support systems, specifically language teachers, ESP, EAP teachers, and then the content subject EMI teachers. So those are the main aims. If we go to the next slide, okay. Those aims have also been um, broken down into five project strands and you can see on the on the slide here an overview of what these project strands involve starting with developing um, the project participants the teachers professional development with training that focuses on specific aspects of emi pedagogy a second strand developing tools resources and materials to support teachers we, we will be talking a little bit about some of those tools later in this webinar Identifying and sharing best practice, monitoring and evaluating, of course, that's also what we're going to be looking at in this webinar. Collecting and analysing baseline data um, about teachers' language proficiency and logical competencies. We talked about this a little bit in that first webinar. So if you're interested in finding out more about that strand, recording of the first webinar. Developing and producing resources to support EMI programs. We will touch upon that as well when we look at the tools um, that I'm going to be talking about later in this webinar. So those are the five project strands. Um, if we go to the next slide, we can see an overview of the three phases that have now taken place since the project started back in August 2019. Um, we talked about this in more detail in that first webinar. So there's just an overview here of three phases, starting in phase one, where we did some needs analysis. We met stakeholders as well. Um, we started to collect some baseline data, moving into the second phase, which involved training, um, the development of what we've called a project resource center where which we're using this is an online resource center which we're using to share resources amongst all the project participants and then moving into the third phase where amongst other things we've been doing the monitoring and evaluation that we're going to be reporting on in this webinar so you can just see there there's th other things that i have i'm not just mentioned in the slide, there's been a lot going on across these three phases. And if you want more detail about this, then please um, have a look at the uh, first webinar, which I will tell you how to access at the end of, of this webinar. If we go to the next slide, Erkan, um, I'll need to hand over to you now, Erkan. These are the 10 categories of EMI teaching competencies that we've been using to help inform our monitoring and evaluation. So, Erkan, I think it's uh, over to you now. Is that all right? Right. Thank you, Jason. So the 10 competence areas we use to uh, help our colleagues, the project participants, to maximize the effectiveness of uh, EMI teaching and also ESP and EAP teaching. So we're going to be looking at uh, each of the 10 categories. 
and uh, with the data we collected and uh, see what kind of evidence uh, we gathered uh, regarding each of the competence areas in 10 categories. So as part of the project aims, um, the EMI project Moodle, uh, you, you can see a screenshot on the slide, uh, served as a platform for the project participants to share their teaching practice. Uh, 10 recordings uploaded, illustrating EMI and ESP teaching practice in different disciplinary fields. So this gave the project participants an opportunity to share their recordings on the platform and to get feedback from their colleagues and also give feedback to their friends and, and suggestions based on the 10 uh, competence areas uh, we just mentioned. And we used the shared recordings uh, on the platform. We analyzed the lecture videos to identify, categorize and tag evidence of best teaching practice. Um, in order to plan a resource, including edited lesson recording videos uh, to share with the institutions uh, with the within the project, uh, the 16 participating institutions and also the institutions beyond uh, the participating universities. Um, we also collected and reported on qualitative data in the form of targeted questionnaires uh, uh, to evidence progress, impact, and uh, future interventions around EMI programs in universities participating in the project. Um, so if you look at the details of the survey data, um, we used a questionnaire with open-ended questions and uh, 36 participants responded. Uh, half of them were EMI teachers and the other half were ESP teachers. And um, four colleagues responded to our call and they filled in their reflective logs. And we reached five more colleagues for follow-up interviews. Um, and let's look at the content of the uh, survey tools. So the questionnaire included 10 open-ended questions uh, to, to get responses from the participants on how they plan their lectures and uh, the impact of the project on their professional development and their uh, uh, future plans in terms of continuing professional development. And the reflective logs had uh, open-ended questions and we asked the participants to reflect on their professional development as part of the EMI project uh, since they, they, their involvement in the project uh, since the beginning and the impact of the project on their uh, professional development. And we also sought um, the further details of the, uh, the project impact through the interviews. And in the interviews, we also asked questions on how EMI teachers and ESP teachers plan their lectures and how they support spoken and written output of their students, how they collaborate with their colleagues and the benefit of this collaboration on their professional development and also their future plans of CPD, professional development. <clears throat> So as part of the first stage in data analysis, um, we identified examples of best practice related to the 10 EMI teaching uh, competency areas, as you can see on the slides. Um, so we ran a content analysis of the lesson recordings, and this analysis revealed evidence of good practice in many of the competency areas, um, those you're seeing on the slide right now. And for the areas that were not possible to observe directly, such as how teachers plan their lectures, we used the data from the survey responses. And we collected uh, evidence uh, through the questionnaire, reflective logs and interviews on the remaining uh, four competency areas, namely EMI planning, supporting students' uh, written and spoken output, how they collaborated with colleagues, and uh, their reflections on their continuing professional development. 
So um, we're happy to see that uh, the data we gathered from the lesson recordings uh, shows strong evidence of good EMI teaching practice uh, related to the 10 competency areas. So that showed a positive impact of the project actually. So the teachers um, were able to um, showcase how they improved and developed their competencies in, 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 in the areas. So let's look at those competency areas specifically. So as for how they activated their students' uh, prior knowledge, so the evidence we collected via lecture recordings has shown a good and effective use of this strategy, such as eliciting the topic of the lecture from students by showing uh, visual prompts, introducing some important keywords for a uh, better comprehension of the lecture and explaining the meaning, meaning of some difficult words, uh, presenting and going over the objectives of the parts of the lecture uh, and what will be covered in each part of the lecture and how it will build on the topics pre previously presented, which would of course help learners uh, better comprehend the topic, the lecture content by connecting the input uh, to their previous knowledge. So activating prior knowledge in that sense is, is, is key to a better comprehension. And the teachers seem to be successfully uh, doing that in the lecture recordings. And lecture recordings also provided evidence of how the teachers made an effective use of multimodal, that is multimedia presentation of content in order to uh, help their learners understand the, uh, the lecture content. The techniques they used included PowerPoint slides with, with pictures and charts and tables and diagrams, which supported the presentation of the content. So that was really, really nice to see that. And there was an effective use of the flip chart and the blackboard or the whiteboard available in the class. And also the use of the realia, the, the, the real objects to illustrate the content. And this was observed specifically in the medical study programs in particular. So it was also good to see a very effective use of edited presentations using uh, digital effects, uh, such as using a green screen and adding visual support and graphs and flowcharts and tables uh, for the illustration and explanation of context. So it's a really good use of uh, multimedia input and guide, uh, to, to guide students' understanding. And another competence area which is important in successful delivery of EMI lectures is the control of the use of the language. So again, we were happy to see good evidence from the lecture recordings and uh, teachers adapting their pace of delivery if the general level of the students is, is low, like adapting and simplifying the language and teachers employing repetition and restatement concepts, explaining the con concepts with uh, examples and providing a glossary of disciplinary terminology, which would again help the learners understand their language and using effective posture and gestures to support their speech. So um, all the elements were there. And some areas for further development in this competence would be maybe um, working more on pronunciation and improved pronunciation and maybe better use of the transition language for a more effective delivery of content. And another area, how teachers supported their spoken output. A, a number of useful strategies and methods were named, uh, such as the use of graphic organizers and uh, providing learners with speaking frames and writing frames to support open outputs. Some background noise. Um, can we ask the participants please to mute their microphones? I'll Thank you. message people in the chat uh, can. Thank you, Jason. Okay. Okay. Uh, in addition, lesson recording showed good evidence of uh, how teachers supported their students out of an interaction. For example, uh, setting pair work activities, group work activities, uh, 
providing language support and providing prompts to use in the uh, pair work group work activities. And again, effective use of the Venn diagrams and speaking frames, and also good use of setting role play activities for learners to use the uh, disciplinary content and, and a language. We observe that, for example, in sample doctor-patient communications in, in medical uh, study programs. So really, really good examples, good strategies of supporting students' uh, spoken output during the lectures. Uh, in terms of supporting written output, um, although a few teachers mentioned their strategies of how they supported their students' writing, um, we were able to gather limited evidence on that. And this was probably because, because um, one of the interview participants said that uh, some EMI teachers tend to leave the responsibility of supporting writing to ESP teachers. So uh, this competence area might require some further observation and maybe further training in the future because um, we were not able to collect uh, evidence on uh, supporting writing practice. That is probably also because writing is a, is a, is a process with some pre-writing planning and brainstorming in class. And extensively, that's an individual work done in the, in, in, at home by the students. So maybe that's, that's why. And in terms of how ESP and EMI teachers develop their materials for EMI, Again, um, it has shown an increased awareness on the importance of careful selection and the design of materials in supporting teaching and learning of content. And for this, findings from the interviews have also uh, revealed that um, the, especially EMI teachers, benefited from the project training, how to create and adapt and develop uh, materials for their teachings. And uh, the, the project also uh, helped them to, to uh, get support from their colleagues, support from ESP colleagues, especially on how to develop better uh, teaching materials. So that was a, a positive observation of the impact of the project on more improved uh, skills on materials development. And finally, for a formative assessment and providing feedback in the classroom, lesson recordings also provided evidence of good practice in the use of effective feedback strategies and formative assessments, such as uh, giving feedback to what uh, students uh, responded to the tasks and how teachers encouraged uh, peer feedback, peer assessment, and self-assessment and also um, uh, the use of different kinds of questions to check on support, to check on and support students' progress, such as the use of Socratic questions. So that was a good observation. So instead of asking simply yes, no questions, um, teachers ask more open-ended questions called Socratic questions like, uh, why do you think so? Uh, what do you mean by that? Can you give an example on that? So these kind of questions better help the teacher to understand, to check if the students understand the topic or not. So it was a good observation of the use of Socratic questions, uh, a good improvement on there. So in addition to the evidence we collected through the lecture recordings, the survey, the questionnaire responses, the reflective, reflective logs, and the um, interview questions also provided evidence uh, on the increased level of awareness on the importance of careful and detailed planning for an effective addressing of the disciplinary uh, content needs of EMI students, as well as addressing their language needs. And amongst the strategies used for planning, use of Bloom's taxonomy is frequently mentioned as a useful resource for better planning of stages of lectures and addressing different orders of thing, 
thinking. Before I share some uh, sample interview extracts with you, uh, for those who are not familiar with the Bloom's taxonomy, so let me illustrate what it would mean. So use of the Bloom's taxonomy would help the teachers better plan their lectures, addressing not only lower order thinking skills of their students, like remembering and understanding, but also more higher order thinking skills. So that in the planning, if they include elements like how they would encourage their learners, how they would help and support their learners to apply the knowledge in a pair work task, in a group work task, or how to use their skills to analyze some texts, how to evaluate the information given, and how to create that is the higher stage, like through supporting uh, speaking tasks and writing tasks. So uh, the teachers were happy that they've learned how to use Bloom's taxonomy in a more effective way in their lectures. So you can see on the slide, on the screen, uh, responses from the interviews. Uh, both EMI teachers and ESP teachers stated that they found the Bloom's taxonomy as a useful strategy to plan their EMI lectures and ESP lectures. Uh, flip learning approach was cited as another useful strategy for the uh, EMI teachers and ESP teachers to provide their students with opportunity to review and study content, including the language. And again, for those who are uh, not very familiar with the flipped classroom approach, the approach is instead of uh, presenting the content in class, right in class, the teachers share the uh, lecture material the PowerPoint slides maybe, or the, the reading text and some uh, supplementary materials like some videos before the class so that students can go over the lecture material and they can study the language as well. So they have more time to better prepare for the lecture. And when they come to lecture, they come better prepared. So the teacher can have more time in the classroom to for more uh, engagements and interactive activities like discussion activities, more production activities, and so on. This is a useful strategy, and this was introduced as part of the EMI project, EMI training. So the evidence we collected through the survey responses revealed that teachers were happy with the use of um, a flipped learning approach as well, uh, thinking that it, it sort of improved the quality of their VMI lectures and it supported, it helped them support learners' understanding of the discovery content and the language uh, of the lectures as well. And you can see on the slides again, a few examples, two extracts from what the interview participants said or what the people who written in the reflective logs. Another evidence was an increased level of awareness, especially on the, on, on, on the side of the EMI teachers. Like how addressing the language needs of the learners, as well as the content needs are important in, in planning and how it supports a better comprehension of their EMI lectures by the students, especially those who, who have uh, limited language skills. So uh, that was another evidence in regards to EMI planning we observed through the interviews. So this is some responses of how some EMI teachers and ESP teachers as well uh, address their learners' language needs by carefully planning the stages of the class, activating their pri prior knowledge and providing uh, necessary vocabulary which would help them to understand the content of the lectures. Because as you know, disciplinary content has come with more discipline specific vocabulary, might be more challenging for the learners to comprehend. So why not pre-teach them uh, if and when necessary. And collecting regular feedback was also highlighted as another strategy. So collecting feedback on a regular basis from your learners after every lecture or by the end of the course is important to revise the, the 
course content, uh, revising the course content and also revising the language. And it seems uh, the participants, the teachers have improved uh, awareness of the importance of collecting feedback. So if you can see, if you look at the first uh, responded, what, what he or she said uh, on thinking that feedback is helpful to both the student and the teacher, and the student receives information with the feedback from the teacher on uh, their understanding of the content, but also as, a, as, import, as, more, as important as the feedback received by the students, teachers collect feedback from their students about the pros and cons of their teaching and how to better improve their teaching. Uh, another area, collaboration with colleagues. It seems that both EMI teachers and ESP teachers have found collaboration beneficial. For EMI teachers, the collaboration and help they are getting from their ESP teacher colleagues have helped them to improve the quality of their planning and the quality of their lecture delivery because they have become more aware of how they should address the language needs of their learners. Because the ESP teachers have the experience and knowledge of how to address language skills, sharing that knowledge and experience with the EMI teachers help the EMI teachers become more aware of the importance of uh, language in EMI teaching. And the support and the collaboration with the ESP teachers, they also learn how to design materials and activities more effectively. And they also uh, had an opportunity to reflect on their EMI teaching because uh, some EMI teachers invited their ESP teacher colleagues to their classrooms and ESP teachers observe them and they give them feedback. So that feedback was useful for EMI teachers to, to improve the, the quality of their EMI teaching. And for the ESP teachers, uh, they seem to be happy with sharing their knowledge and expertise with EMI teachers in helping out for a better integration of the planning, for example, like how to use Bloom's taxonomy, sharing their knowledge with their EMI teachers, how to share their knowledge with them, how to develop materials to support students' language skills and productive skills. Because this was part of the pedagogical training of the ESP teachers. Because when they receive their education, they, they, they get their training at the Faculty of Education, ESP and AP teachers. So, so they know about these pedagogical uh, methodological approaches. But not all EMI teachers have that pedagogical education. So it's a great opportunity to collaborate with an ESP teacher so that ESP teachers can share their experience and expertise on, on the methodological approaches on how to uh, provide language support and so on. And some ESP teachers also mentioned that the collaboration with EMI teachers that helped them better observe and understand the specific disciplinary language needs and requirements for their learners. Because the observing the EMI teachers gave them an opportunity to see the EMI students, how they struggle with the challenges of EMI lectures. So that they uh, observed and they, uh, it, it helped them, they said, to plan and to revise their ESP support strategies. They observed what language to provide more support on or whether they should give more support on the speaking needs, the writing needs of their students. So it was a mutual sort of collaboration and a mutual benefit, both for EMI teachers and for ESP teachers as well. Okay, this is um, what I said. Um, as we've just seen, the most frequently raised themes on from EMI training events were the perceived usefulness of Bloom's taxonomy, which I just explained for more effective lecture planning and delivery, and also the potential of a flipped learning approach in supporting students' comprehension of lecture content and, and language. Um, so, um, very briefly, before I um, leave the stage to Jason again, 
So the evaluation of findings from this strand of the project has confirmed the importance of the role of ESP teachers. The role of ESP teachers can play improving the quality of my teaching. I don't know if we have participants, ESP teacher participants in this uh, webinar. As, uh, as pointed out by Julie Derden, an, an EMI expert, in her publication 2018, she says, ESP teachers' role seems to become increasingly more important in EMI higher education contexts. Because in a carefully planned collaboration scheme, ESP teachers can pro provide more subject-specific support to EMI teachers and EMI students. While at the same time, they can increase their own knowledge of subject-specific language requirements by observing lectures and classes and co-planning lectures uh, with their EMI colleagues. So within the higher education EMI settings, there is a need for a clearer definition of the roles and responsibilities of ESP teachers in their collaboration with EMI academics. Uh, because the knowledge and the skill set ESP teachers possess would be useful to support students with EAP and ESP, and it would be useful to monitor and share their students' language levels with the EMI academics. So when they observe their ESP and EAP learners, uh, their EMI learners language with the EMI teachers, EMI teachers with that knowledge can uh, adjust their language so they can know more about the EMI learners with this sharing. And ESP teachers can also provide language support to their EMI colleagues. They can provide pedagogical support to their EMI colleagues. They can share their interactive pedagogy skills, such as like how to support speaking, how to support writing activities. And they can also provide help and support uh, to raise EMI teachers' linguistic awareness, how they, should how they can adjust their language in, in their EMI lectures, also, they can also provide support to uh, improve and develop EMI colleagues' uh, language skills, how to improve their pronunciation, how to help them with uh, improving their uh, speech, improving their writing skills, and so on. So that collaboration, as this, this project uh, revealed, is, is very important for a successful integration, implementation, and improvement of EMI teaching policies in higher education context, the close collaboration between EMI teachers and ESP, EAP teachers. Jason, that's all from me. Um, that's over Thank to you now. Thank you. Um, so um, I'm going to now just move into the third final section of the webinar and just give you some information about some of the tools that we've developed to support EMI teachers. There's four tools that I'm going to very briefly talk about. The first is a teaching standards framework. This is a framework with descriptions of teaching practice. So this uh, really builds on what Erkan's just been talking about in terms of the monitoring and evaluation because he's been talking about um, the evidence that's, that's been ga gathered to help describe teaching practice, and this framework then builds on that. Um, I'm going to talk about a self-assessment checklist that's been developed, your observation template, and finally a syllabus template. Okay, next. So let's first of all, talk about the teaching standards framework. And I think this is a really important tool that's being developed out of this project. So this is a framework describing teaching practice across those same 10 areas of competency that um, Erkan talked about. And we showed you right at the start of his section. So these 10 areas. Um, and what's also been quite unique about how we've gone about building this framework is that it's it's being built from the ground up so it's involved participating teachers discussing and reflecting on their own practice and describing that practice in relation to those 10 competency areas so the teachers um, have a, a big part in building this this framework and that, that's 
quite an unusual approach, I think, to going about constructing a framework of teaching standards. Um, but I think it's really good that that's how we've done it. There was a, a phase as well of getting some feedback from selected experts, and then that feedback was reviewed and built into the, uh, the, the a sort of second version of the framework. And we've also delivered some webinars with um, ideas about how to implement the framework. That's what we're going to look at in a moment as well in terms of um, two other tools, the self-assessment checklist and the, the peer observation template, because these um, are ways of actually implementing the framework. I'll explain that in a moment. Let's first of all, if we go to the next slide. Um, oh, I should, I should just say as well that these are some uses for the framework that we might think about at an individual level. Um, I'll give you a moment just to have a look at some of those ideas there. The ideas in bold are important for what I want to talk about in a minute in terms of self-assessment and um, peer feedback. And then if we just look at the next slide, Okan, so these are some ideas for uses of the, the framework at an institutional level. And again, the ideas in bold there are relevant to the tools that we're going to be um, very briefly looking at in a moment. If we go then to the next slide, um, the framework is also built around this idea of a sort of cyclical process, because those competencies, the 10 competencies, can also be related to this, this idea of a sort of cycle of professional development. The first competency is focused on planning for EMI. The next eight competency areas are all focusing on the delivery of EMI. And then we've got a final 10th competency area, which focuses on continue, continuing professional development. And we envisage that this is a cycle. If we go to the next slide, we can see um, one of the competencies, competency areas in more detail. We, we don't have time to look through all 10 in detail. Um, the first competency area is planning for EMI, and Erkan has already talked a little bit about this particular competency area. Um, if we look at the next slide, these are some examples of descriptions of teaching practice in relation to this particular competency area. <clears throat> so these are the descriptions that have been created, first of all, by teachers discussing and reflecting on their practice. And then these descriptions going through a process of feedback with, with um, EMI experts and other stakeholders having a look at these descriptions and giving feedback and then that feedback being uh, integrated in, in, into what you're now seeing in front of you. These are the descriptions take, taken from the framework as it now exists. Again, I'm not going to talk through these in detail. If we go to the next slide, you'll see some more. Each competency area has between sort of seven to 12 descriptions. These are, again, on, on the screen, more descriptions of teaching practice in, related, in relation to the planning for EMI competency area. And if we go to the next slide, Erkan, these are the final, oh, if we just go back very quickly. I think you've jumped ahead, Erkan. You need to go back. Yeah, thanks. Oh, yeah, there, there we are. These are oh, one forward. Those are the final set of descriptions for the planning for EMI competency area. Um, if you're interested in getting a copy of this framework to look at these descriptions in more detail, then you should contact the British Council. So that was the first tool and um, the, this teaching framework. If we now go to the next slide, Erkan, I want to 
that talk about how the framework can be used to develop other tools. So one of the tools that we've developed, and it's you know, based on the framework, is the idea of a self-assessment checklist. So this is a tool that can be used by teachers to um, reflect on their own practice, to look at the, those detailed descriptions of practice from the framework, and to think about areas um, where you know, they feel that they're, they're doing well in and areas where maybe there's opportunities for some kind of development. Um, of course, what's important when you're using um, a self-assessment checklist is to also develop or identify rather some targets and actions for yourself as a, as a teacher. If we go to the next slide, we can see an actual example of a checklist tool. This is a this is one that's based on that planning competency area. So you can see there's the um, descriptions of, of practice, and then there's a self-assessment um, the, in the columns on the right where teachers can, are, are able to reflect on their practice in relation to a particular aspect of their practice. Okay, so that's a self-assessment checklist. If we go to the next slide, please. A third tool that we've developed um, on the project is a peer observation template. Um, Erkan talked about encouraging um, collaboration between language teachers and subject teachers. One aspect of that collaboration could be peer observation, where you go and observe each other's lessons. Um, to do that effectively, it's really good to have um, a sort of structured template for the observation um, and to use a pair observation form. So that's the, the tool that we've, that we've developed. If we go to the next slide. The template that we've developed for the project has three stages to it. There's a pre-observation stage where you would meet with the two of you to talk about the um, sort of intended outcomes for the observation. And that's where you the teaching standards framework to set the focus for the observation. The second part of the template is, is what would be completed during the observation itself. Again, there can be some prompts there for the observation based on the teaching standards framework. And then there's a post observation phase where the two of you meet after the observation to, to talk about you know, the experience and to hopefully set some targets. And again, the teaching standards framework can help set those targets, but also inform the discussion that takes place. So you can really see how that teaching standards framework is so important to inform these professional discussions. If we go to the next slide, Erkan. Can we go to that? Yeah. So the fourth tool that I, I want to mention is a syllabus planning tool that we've developed. Um, and we've also piloted this at some institutions as well. So this is a, a tool to help teachers plan a program. So it's a curriculum syllabus template. It's got um, a guidance document that goes with it as well to really help teachers think think about the, the, the kinds of um, issues to be aware of when planning a curriculum or a syllabus for EMI. And if we go to the next slide, we see a little bit what the syllabus looks like. I don't know, that slide gives, gives you, good if you can see that in any detail, um, but that's just an idea of what the template looks like. So again, this is a tool that participating institutions are going to be able to access. Um, if you're interested in seeing this, then I, I think it's OK for me to say get in touch with the British Council to to. Um, and that's the case for any of the tools that I've just mentioned. So those are four tools that we've developed to help support EMI teachers, the framework, the teaching standards framework, and then Based on that framework, things like self-assessment checklists, the peer observation templates, and then this syllabus um, curriculum planning template to help teachers plan a, an EMI program. 
So, Erkan, we can now, we're coming towards the end. I think we can take questions from people. I think that's the next slide. Yes, it is. Does anyone have any questions for us? So if you do, you can either turn your microphones on or you can enter your questions for us in the chat. So these might be questions for Erkan about the monitoring and evaluation that he talked about, or questions for me about those four tools that I very briefly outlined. Any questions for us? Okay. Olga, if you're still there, can you just confirm, because I just said there that if people are interested in getting those tools, such as the teaching standards framework, I said that people could contact the British Council. Was that okay for me to say that? Um, yes, Jason, sure. Uh, they can uh, address us and we are going to share uh, the tools, um, especially the key ones that uh, might be very useful for the university people to develop their strategies, like Thank you. my teaching standard framework uh, with the universities. Um, and uh, uh, this, at that moment, uh, actually, this text is being uh, translated until it will be available uh, in two languages. Okay, great. So, I think there was uh, an attempt to ask a question. Okay. So if someone does have a question, you can turn your microphone on or um, put it into the chat. Okay, so there's a question from Akmal. Is, is there any online platform to evaluate content teachers? Um, so, um, Akmal, you might need to give me a little bit more information about what you mean by evaluating the, the content teachers. Um, the, the only on, online platform for the project is what we've called a project resource center, Erkan uh, refer to it as the project Moodle. Um, so this is a, an, an online um, resource for sharing things like the tools that I described, but also that's where the lesson recordings that Erkan was referring to, that's where those recordings were uploaded. Um, we've also put all the materials from all the training on that resource center as well. So it's, that platform has been used to share resources and experiences and ideas. Um, so Ackman, you do mean materials, right, okay. So yeah, if you go to, if you're part, if you're working at an institution that's part of the project, which I believe you are, then you should have access to that project resource center where you can access all these tools and resources and um, materials. If you can't access it for whatever reason, then please get in contact. So get in contact with the British Council and then they will refer, um, refer you to me and I can sort that out. If there are no questions, then I want to just finish off by just saying a little bit more about where you can get more information about the project. So, can we go to the next slide, Erkan? I mentioned at the start that there is a recording of the first webinar. If you didn't come to that and you'd like to watch it, then go to the British Council Uzbekistan's YouTube channel and you can find it there. So this is a recording of the first webinar. The recording of this webinar will also um, go up on that, that YouTube channel at some point. If we go to the next slide, um, more information about the project is also available at the British Council Uzbekistan's um, website. This is the section on their website 
devoted to EMI, you can see in front of you there. And um, there's that picture includes some of the project participants, some of the teachers working in the project. So that's the British Council of Uzbekistan's website. And then if we go to the next slide, British Council of Uzbekistan also have a Facebook page. And what um, they've started to do, which is really good to see as well, is publish success stories. So these are um, reports, short reports written by some of the participants in the project, just talking about the impact the project has had on them. So there's, I think there's two success stories already up there to look at, um, and there will be more coming. So that's the British Council of Uzbekistan's Facebook page. Okay, so that's how you can get more information about the project. You can also, of course, contact the British Council directly. And Olga Kim um, has been on, uh, has been participating in this webinar and she spoke at the, at the beginning. So please contact Olga if you need to know more about the project. If we go to the final slide, just to let you know that the third webinar, the final webinar, which will be a panel discussion, that's going to be next Friday. Um, please come along to that. You're going to be able to uh, find out even more about two particular strands to the project, which have been very important. Flip, the flip learning approach that Erkan also mentioned in his section, and then also more about assessment in EMI because um, the project has included some training on that as well. We also hope as part of the panel discussion to have some of the project participants, I believe there will be two project participants also involved in that panel discussion. Okay, so thank you very much. I